sick. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Welcome back to the Early Bath Football Podcast. I am joined by Ed. Ed back after maybe a week or two away. Chris is here, sober, I think. Uh, who knows? Barnes is here. And also Lynch is back after a, a week or so away. He's been to like festivals and everything. He's been living life. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, this is episode maybe 14, I think. I've written down 14 as the title of this recording. I think it's 14. But who knows? And we'll just we'll just roll with it. But and um, there's lots of football to talk about, so let's just crack on. First of all, Premier League review of the last weekend's games, and we're recording this when this match week hasn't even finished because Brighton, the who could go top tonight, by the way, uh, could go top if they beat Crystal Palace in the M23 derby, the biggest derby of the Premier League season. Um, other than that, though, there's lots of other things that happen. Ed. Um, do you want to talk about how how Liverpool maybe got on this week? Mm, yeah, it was a, I mean, a great game for the neutral. <laughs> what a game! Um, it's a frustrating one for Liverpool fans, I think. Um, but it does it doesn't hurt as much as I thought it would because I think Brentford away is going to be a tough fixture for a lot of the big sides this year, and I can see a couple of other big teams slipping up there. So. We didn't lose the game, <laughs> which is a pretty poor mentality to have, but we didn't lose the game. There were some positives. I thought Curtis Jones played well. Um, and, there, yeah, I thought it was a good performance going forward. Defensively, a few question marks. I think Klopp came out after the game and sort of defended the defenders, but I hope behind closed doors he gave them a bit of a uh, kick up the backside because... It wasn't great defensively, particularly away from home when you need to really keep a close, um, a close defence. Um, so yeah, not a great performance, but could have been worse. As, as a Liverpool fan, you know we 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 talked on the pod myself, Chris uh, Barnes, and Jack uh, last week. We both sort of well, we all sort of disagreed. Ash thought it. I, don't, I can't remember what you said. Ash, was it going to be a tight game? Were you expecting a tight game? Yeah. And then Jack was yeah. expecting a walkover for Liverpool. Chris then also agreed with Ash. As a Liverpool fan, what were you expecting from Brentford? Tight game. Yeah, I knew it wasn't going to be an easy game. Um, which is why I think there really needed to be an emphasis on being tight at the back um, and nicking a goal and then getting them on the break again because they are a good side going forward and they are difficult to break down. I think their the defensive record this season has been one of the best. So, yeah, I knew it was going to be a difficult game. But... Um, yeah, I think take a point. Take a point away from home against a newly promoted yeah, side. Yeah, still the only side unbeaten, I think. There you go, then. Chris, um, do you want to talk about how maybe North London is a certain colour? Uh, well, I'll actually start by correcting Ed, and I'm surprised you didn't correct Ed there, Tang, because obviously Brent Brighton and beat. beaten, because Brighton, <laughs> Brighton beaten 1-0 with a Leandro yeah. Trossard last-minute winner a few weeks ago. But, yeah, we'll talk about North London being red, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I mean, in fairness, that's probably Arsenal's best performance I've seen in a very long time. Probably, I'd probably argue since the, the Chelsea game, Boxing Day last season, when obviously Arteta was under a lot of pressure back then as well. And obviously he, he played, you know, Saka and Smith Rowe sort of for like the first time and they beat Chelsea 3-1. But yeah, the, 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 the first half was probably the best I've seen, like I said, best I've seen Arsenal play for a very long time. I mean, well, to be honest, the whole team, like everyone just put in at least a seven out of 10 performance. Like there was not one Arsenal player that, even the ones that come on, there wasn't an Arsenal player that you'd say, oh, he, he wasn't that good. Everyone put in a shift and everyone wanted it. And it was, it was fantastic. I mean, it, I mean, it's quite interesting because Arsenal used all of their summer signings yesterday. Obviously, they had four starting. So obviously, Ramsdale started and our initial apology to Ramsdale because when he first signed, I was a bit like, "Well, we don't need him, we don't need him." But in, in fairness, he's he's come in, played three league games, kept two two clean sheets, and he, he made that crucial save from Lucas Moura where it took that deflection. He's tipped it onto the bar. T Tommy Yasu, who's well, he's been a breath of fresh air. He was fantastic yesterday. I think the, the Arsenal Twitter, which I think they've taken into account the Arsenal fans on Twitter, they gave him man of the match yesterday, which. You know, fa fair enough. Like too fair. Like I said, you pr probably could have gave it to anyone on the pitch for Arsenal. But yeah, he was fantastic. I mean, it's interesting because obviously Tottenham wanted Tommy Yasu, but then opted to sign Romero, which 
obviously, w- w- and again, I apologise for the Tomasu- Tomiyasu signing because again, I thought, well, we're just after Tottenham scraps. It's kind of like now we're sitting here thinking, w- w- why didn't Tottenham sign him? <laughs> why did they let Arsenal sign him? Why did they sign Everson Royal instead? And then obviously, obviously Ben White again. He had a solid game. Him and Gabriel looked like quite a good partnership back then. Yeah, er- Erdegaard again was sensational along with Saka and Smith Rowe behind the Bamiyang. And then obviously Sambi Lakonga and Nuno Tavares come on. But obviously that was like interesting as well because like if you look at the Tottenham side of things, like you look at Tottenham starting eleven, it was pretty much a mi- mix and match of Mauricio Pochettino and Jose Mourinho's team. There was no new signings that Nuno brought in or the board brought in. Like you don't know whether Nuno's in charge of the signs at Tottenham because I know they did bring in a new director of football in the summer. I can't remember what his name is, but. I know he's working at Juventus and that, but like consider Romero was one of the you know highly rated centre backs. So he had a great season at Atlanta last season, and a lot of people saw it as a coup for Tottenham bringing him in. And he, he didn't start whether he's match fit or not is another question. But then obviously they've got Emerson Royal in, and they got at Brian Hill, and none of them played. I I don't know like for for a derby game you, you expect like both teams to be up for it in that but you look at some of the attitudes of some of the Tottenham players it was it, it was a bit amateur disgraceful pathetic as I've once said about Arsenal before on this podcast I mean as, as, especially Harry Kane you you can just tell Harry Kane does not want to be in a Tottenham shirt he, literally his attitude yesterday was n- nothing short of disgrace I mean this is a lot of people saying, oh, Harry Kane, he's one of the most professional people around. I'm sorry, if that's one of the most professional people around, then blind me, I think we're in the wrong prof- profession, lads. But yeah, <laughs> no, but yeah, no obviously, obviously, it's lovely to see that North London is red. Too fair, it's always been red because Spurs, <laughs> Spurs can't win any trophies. That's their problem. And well, yeah. that's the problem they're always going to have. <clears throat> they're just not going to win anything. Not even the Europa Conference League. Oh, wow. Uh, and it's nice to see after after your performance on the last pod. Nice to see apologies already coming out, Chris, to Ramsdale <laughs> and Tomiyasu. Uh, I'm sure Carly Ray Jepsen, uh, Steve Bruce, and the state of Brazil can expect their apologies in the next hour or so. Um, <laughs> Barnes, uh, you messaged me and you said that Ars- uh, Spurs made Arsenal look like a prime Barcelona. Um, after you've had now 24 hours or so to to calm down from the emotion of the North London derby, um, do you, was it a case of Arsenal being very good, Spurs being very bad, or a bit of both? Yeah, de- de- definitely a bit of both. I think I might have gone a bit far on Prime Barcelona, but yeah, <laughs> in the in the first 30 minutes, I don't know if I've seen a worse performance by a team than Tottenham and a great performance from Arsenal, like simultaneously. They Tottenham would just every single. I know this, I don't want to sound like Graham Souness and start talking about uh, second balls for the entire podcast, but uh, Tottenham lost every single second ball. Arsenal showed really good intent. I think it was it was one of those games where it was a real sort of seesaw. Like if if Tottenham had lost, well, Tottenham did lose, so now Arsenal great and Tottenham are like in the mud and in big trouble. If it had gone the other way, then. You just know that it would be that all the comments would be about Arsenal, be about Arteta out, all those kind of things. But the most interesting thing about it is, I know Arsenal did smash them in the actual game, but then if you look at the table, they're both on nine points together. But if you looked at Twitter, or you know, your and loads of people say Arsenal were on the up and Tottenham are on the down. I think Nuno got it wrong with his tactics. This player, I think Chris mentioned some of his player selections. Um, Tanganga, I think really, I thought he was really good. He's had a good start to the season, despite getting sent off against against Palace. But I thought he looked really, he really struggled uh, at right back. I think Undon Bele, he looked such a good player at times. Was it two seasons ago they signed him, or maybe last season? But I, I feel he had a really poor game. And I think uh, Party, Jacker, and Odegaard were excellent. Uh, I particularly pick out Odegaard. I thought he was man of the match in the game. I think every single goal he had a crucial involvement in whether it be a touch to set someone free or a good a good run to make space and I think he could be a turn out to be a really good signing for Arsenal. Yeah and you know I think from looking at it Spurs looked a bit naive. They looked a bit void of ideas and, and Lynch as an Arsenal fan. Ironically Spurs looked a bit arsenally 
I thought, you know, they looked a bit just sort of didn't know what they were doing, a bit lack of confidence. Did, what, what were your thoughts on the game? Yeah, I mean, like Chrissy said, I mean, it's almost a given for North London Derby. It's the, I mean, personally, as an Arsenal fan, I think it's the biggest game of the season for us. And Tottenham fans would feel similar. And as a given, you expect your team to put in literally everything, like leave it on the pitch and just put your absolute all into that game. You know how much it means to the fans. But I mean, it was so surprising. First of all, the lack of a game plan you saw from Tottenham. But second of all, um, like Chris said, the lack of effort. I mean, I remember look, uh, re-watching the, the first goal. I mean, it's literally 12 minutes in and you see Hoiberg and, and Dombele literally walking back. Like, you know, and Saka's just going past them, but they're literally not even, you know, you expect them to be absolutely sprinting back. I mean, the game's hardly even started. You, you mean, you look at it and you think they're like, it's like in the 80th, 80th minute or something, they're absolutely knackered. And it's literally like 10 minutes into the game and they're jogging, which looks pretty worrying from an outsider's perspective. Because, you know, if your players can't put an effort in a big game like that so early on in the game as well, then what's it going to be like further down the line? Definitely, definitely. Yeah, Spurs just looked... Just as I said, a bit arsenally, and that's uh, that's a descriptor I'm going to use there. Um, Ed, what else caught your eye in the Premier League over the weekend? Or are you going to talk about the Crystal Palace Brighton game, which I said is the biggest game of the season? Um, there were quite a few things that caught my eye. I think uh, from a from a fancy football point of view, I was keeping quite a keen eye on Leicester because I've had James Madison since the start of the season. And for about three weeks, I've been toying whether to get rid of him or not. But I've had bigger fires to fight, to, for <laughs> want of a better phrase. And Leicester have looked poor so far this season. They've really struggled going forward and they've been leaking goals at the back. Um, at home against Burnley, I thought... Burnley have also been in pretty poor form, so it'd be interesting to see which one of these sides turned up. And it it was a pretty feisty game, to be fair. Both teams came out wanting to try and play football, getting stuck in. And for it to finish 2-2, I think, is a fair reflection of where both teams are at at the moment. I think Leicester, you know, without Jamie Vardy, which really struggle for goals at the moment. Um, he's had quite a good start to the season. Obviously, put one in his own net for the first goal, but... Um, but he seems to be bang in form where everybody else isn't. And I think they rely really heavily on him for goals. Um, Burnley, we talked a bit about, about it at the start of the season where a lot of pundits were writing off Burnley this year. And I think on the podcast, we said, what is it that Burnley have done differently this year that they don't do every other year, which is not spend very much and rely on the same players to play a certain way and get results. Um, but this start of this season they've not looked very good and they are looking like they will be down there. So maybe these pundits actually do know something that we don't know because <laughs> quite often we say, well, they just paid to make up stories and for clickbait, but this is this isn't talk sport. So this far, isn't talk sport. exactly. This is a talk <laughs> sport. This is detailed analysis. <laughs> uh, but I, yeah, I thought that was a, a really interesting result. Um, obviously the big one, Man United Villa, which I presume is what we're going to come on to next. Um, I don't think it was a particularly great game. I didn't watch all of it, but the result speaks volumes. There you go. Well, uh, I'll move that on to Chris. Chris, uh, first question, did you win at the weekend against uh, the Villagers? And did you watch any other Premier League football? Uh, so f to answer your first question, no, we didn't. We we, we, we oh. went 2 we went two up after about 50, 55 minutes and then just had like five minutes of madness where he just conceded three goals and it just went downhill oh, from no. there. Poor and, game management, yeah. that is. Uh, to, to, fair, to, to, to be fair, we only had, we only had 13 um, players and like we literally had an injury after 15 minutes, which obviously didn't help, left us down to obviously 12 men. What is it? Obviously, with our football, we can use roll-on, roll-off subs, but, oh. but when you have like... Then we had another injury later, later on in the game and then people that were left on the pitch were either injured or in my case just just completely unfit just un, just shattered like literally it's like the fifa stamina bar like to be fair my stamina bar probably gets down to a quarter after the first half <laughs> and that but um but, but yeah so obviously that wasn't good and, and yeah yeah to answer your other question i did watch um some of the other premier league games um i i will dive into um the the man U game in a minute but i just want to say like just from probably from all of us, like it was great seeing Raul Jimenez get his first goal for Wolves after what he's been through the past year with you know suffering that horrendous injury November last year against Arsenal and whether he would actually come back and play football. So seeing it and he took his goal really well. Obviously, Sar Sars launched a big kick to pretty much towards his direction. He's just been 
stronger than I, th- I think it was Bednarek. He was stronger than and he's like taken on a couple of players and sorted it past McCarthy. It was a brilliant finish. It was lovely to see him go over to the Wolves fans and celebrate with them. But yeah, go- going on top of the Manchester United game, it, it was an interesting game because if you look at the stats on paper without watching the game, you would have thought uh, Man United completely dominated and battered Aston Villa. But when I watched the game on match of the day, Villa had so many better chances. Villa should have probably beaten Manchester United, you know, three or four one if you if you will, if you know, because obviously Fernandez should have really scored the penalty. And I think a certain CR seven is probably going to be taking the penalties from now on after Fernandez's penalty went into orbit, as 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 you showed me on the match of the day two thing just before we went on air. Obviously, if you got if you guys didn't watch match of the day two. I, I recommend going, going and watching the last bit where they do pretty much do an Apollo 13 uh, where you have lift off and that. And obviously, it's just Fernandez <laughs> taking penalty in that. But, but yeah, no, it's like it, it, it wasn't undeserved. Aston Villa played really well against Man United. They took the games and they forced mistakes. And it, it was interesting because I did, I, I, I did watch the United views, like full view. Obviously, if you're a Man United fan or if you're just a fan of Owen. You know, I recommend watching yeah. the United view, and obviously they talked about. It. And it was interesting because I'd probably say about seventy to thirty. It was seventy to thirty in the comments as to whether they wanted Ollie out, and obviously majority wanted Ollie out, saying, "Oh, uh, you know, it was it, it was poor team selection, pretty much playing Manchester United fans' favourite two and Fred and McTominay in centre midfield." And obviously, again, like. To, to be fair, you couldn't blame Ollie with the substitutions for this game because obviously Shaw got injured in the first half and then Maguire got injured. And then obviously Ollie's final change obviously brought Cavani on later on. But a, a lot of people were, were scathing at Solskjaer saying, oh, oh, he shouldn't last until the end of the season or replace him now, bring in Conte, bring in Zidane. And it was quite interesting to see that because you also look at the table, there's still only a point off top and it's still far too early in the season to make a judgment call. All right, if you get to sort of December time and man, you have struggled in the Champions League group and are nowhere near fighting for the title, then you could probably say, All right, Ollie has to go. But I, I think it was a bit scathing of the United fans to sort of say, Oh, Ollie's got to go now. We need to get someone in right away to replace him. Because, all right, don't get me wrong, I, I don't think Ollie is the right man long term for Manchester United. But look at what he's done on paper. He actually has done a good job at Manchester United. I mean, he's got him. Um, he got them a second place finish last season, and that which you know is the highest they finished, you know, since they got rid of Mourinho, and that. So yeah, obviously that was quite interesting, and like obviously a little bit of controversy about the winning goal as well, because of, of like technically yes, Ollie Watkins was standing in an offside position, but that is the one thing that annoys me about the Premier League referees, like Union as a whole. Like we saw it in that Brighton Leicester game last week where. Obviously, Harvey. It, it was Harvey Barnes. He, he did it twice. He stood in front of Sanchez, and they and VAR or whoever the ref was on VAR ruled it off because they thought Barnes was interfering with with Sanchez. Whereas, obviously, that that logic should be taken into you know the May Aston Villa game logic, thinking uh, Watkins is interfering with De Gea. Surely he's offside, or or the logic of you know, Watkins isn't offside, has to be taken into the Brighton-Leicester game, or, oh, no, Barnes is offside. It would be just nice if the refs could... I, I know refereeing is a difficult job in that, but it would be nice if they could be like cons- a consistency across all of the games rather than, oh, it's going to be offside in this game, but in this game, oh, no, it's not going to be offside. Yeah, I think the st- we, 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 we talked about at the Euros where the standard refereeing was, you know, I thought it was quite good. And I think a lot of people sort of raved about the refereeing at the Euros. So there's always going to be a debate about refereeing whatever season we are. Um, Barnes, you've just to touch on the, the Man United point and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, you've been a bit, uh, let's say, Oli sceptical in recent times. Um, <laughs> Oli phobic. <laughs> Oli phobic. <laughs> Oli phobic, one might say. Uh, do you think every defeat is just going to all the Ollie out people are going to come out for him and he's in a bit of a difficult position. But I, I know we were around Lafey's on, on Saturday night and he skipped past the the Man United game. And he wouldn't let us watch it. So I don't know if you have any insight into the Man United Aston Villa game. Yeah, I guess, I guess my best insight was when, uh, so a few of us went to watch the mighty Yellows Oxford United at the weekend yeah. and on the coach on the way there, 
um, Lavey was listening to the Manchester United game and his his agony when uh, Bruno Fernandes missed that penalty was superb. <laughs> he was not happy at all. And yeah, later on, he wouldn't let us watch uh, the game on match today. So I think that says it all. Um, on Oli, I, I'd say I'm more Oli Oli sceptical than Oli phobic. You know? But I, I'll tell you what was interesting. I don't know if any of you watched after the game, Gary Neville made some was talking to my Tyler about um, you know, what he thinks about Oli and where Manchester United are sort of at. And he, he made the point that he's like, oh, Manchester United have had we you know, we've been down the experience uh, manager route. We've had Moyes, we've had Van Gaal, we've had Jose Mourinho, you know, so we've got Oli to go in a different direction. And I just thought, what a bizarre comment. Like you've been down the experienced manager route. So you're not going to get any other experienced manager ever again because you've had you know, poor experience with, you know, so you can get Ollie who's got no CV whatsoever. Like, that, there's just no logic to that. That's just like, oh, well, we did some other stuff. It didn't work out. So let's just get, you know, let's just, let's just do this and hope. It's basically a hit and hope, you know. Um, so I didn't really understand, understand that from Gary Neville. I'll tell you with this, you know, you can lose games in the Premier League. You know, it can happen. Aston Villa are a decent side. But it's just the continuing issue with Manchester United. They don't, they just don't have a pattern of play. They're not, they're never convincing whether they win, uh, even if they've gone a huge run. You know, you never, you know, think convincingly, oh, Manchester United are going to win this game. And I think that's something that throughout Ollie's tenure, they've never really shaken off. I think Gary Neville also said they don't really play as a team. It's very much based on individuals and moments. I completely agree with that. They got, they got some excellent players. Uh, Pogba, obviously Ronaldo now, Fernandez, you got Rashford, I know he's not played yet, Sancho, you know, the list of stars. It's almost it's almost like Galacticos, like sort of like Varane that, that they have. I really think, you know, some of the Manchester United fans, it's interesting how some of them have such a high expectation we should be winning every game and win the league. And some of them have quite a low expectation we should just be, you know, Ollie, Ollie's doing all right, we'll take you know, fourth place and go again. This it's quite interesting, sort of different opinions on that. But I'm sure I'm sure Ollie will be given at least probably at least six months, at least the rest of the season to see what he can do. Because let's face it, there's not really too many great managers out there at the minute. Yeah, absolutely. We've we've discussed this extensively on who would even come in for Ollie. Um Lynchy, you you're also part of the prestigious group which uh Lafey skipped match of the day for uh, so we couldn't watch the Man United Aston Villa game after your, let's say, unbelievable performance at bowling. Uh, you won both games by a country mile. If anyone needs a bowler, <laughs> Dan Lynch is your man. Um, and just to touch on Ash's, Ash's point, um, I, I watched a Gary Neville sort of uh, clip earlier where he says United, you know, they don't have a style of play, they, they rely on the moments, they rely on, you know, good like, piece of magic from individual players. Um, to what extent do you agree with that? And could you argue that that is kind of maybe the style of Man United, just to rely on a moment of magic? Is Could you describe that as a, a, a play style? Yeah, I mean, I definitely wouldn't describe it as a style of play because I think your luck's going to run out eventually. You know, when you look to those players, they aren't going to be able to deliver every single game. And if you're over-relying on them to deliver those moments of brilliance in a game, then eventually they're not going to be able to for one or two games. It's like, I totally agree what Barnes said, that's the point I was going to touch on, where they don't seem to look like the players as a team. They are looking for individual moments of brilliance. For instance, I think, for instance, in the first couple of games, Greenwood was looked really good. I mean, he was scoring an assist. And obviously, I think he sort of dropped off since Ronaldo's come in a bit, sort of stolen his limelight, I guess, and as such. Even like the game Newcastle, for instance, you know, I think at one all it could have really gone either way. I know they weren't ran out 5-1 winners, same with the West Ham game. I think they were, you know, it was always a moment of brilliance, wasn't it? At the end from Lingard, it wasn't like it was a entirely convincing performance from uh, in that game either. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a, a bit of a hard one, man. You know, because like you say, there's not, <coughs> <laughs> there's not, um, <laughs> there's not been like a consistent streak where like they have been like really convincing in a string of games like it's like it's, you still think like they're not entirely convincing me i think that's the level you you have to get to to be able to win the league so i just can't see them they will challenge like they'll give top teams good games i think when they will come uh play them but i think just that level of inconsistency and the 
where you, how you can't rely on players to give you moments of brilliance throughout an entire Premier League season will just let them down at the end. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what sort of level of sustainability there is for Man United. There. If you're just relying on individual players and, you know, as you say, people have off days, a lot of players have off days. It's that level of inconsistency, which I think might United might fall down this season. Um, but anyway, I digress. Um, Chris's mum did join us, I think, again shortly for that segment. Um, so lovely to see her again, I guess, a friend of the pod. Um, we'll Start move... the pod at a minute. <laughs> we'll move <laughs> swiftly on to the Champions League. And I, I didn't even know it was Champions League this week, but um, just looking at the fixtures, there's some pretty big games. Uh, PSG versus City stands out to me. So does Juventus versus Chelsea. Uh, and so does Sheriff against Real Madrid. But Ed, where would you like to focus on uh, this week? I mean, for me, Liverpool's games are always going to be a focus. We've got quite a tough group, actually. I don't think... I know we've we've steamrolled Porto away in the past, but it's still going to be a difficult game. The fix, fixtures are coming thick and fast. I think the big one, yeah, is Paris Saint-Germain against Man City. Paris Saint-Germain have had a tough start to life uh, with all these new signings that they've had. Um, I've seen that they've won a couple in uh, in Ligue 1 last minute. But um, yeah, this is a big game for them. I think um, Messi is set to start and he needs to uh, needs to become their talisman because he obviously got brought off in the last one, didn't he? And he wasn't very impressed. Um, Man City on a bit of a roll at the moment as well. Good result for them against uh, Chelsea at the weekend. Um, I think they've got to be looking at winning the Champions League as they do every year. And they obviously came very close last year. I think Pep's going to be putting out his, his best eleven for every single Champions League game. So the fact that they're away at Paris Saint Germain doesn't concern me. I think I think Man City could win that. Chris, do you think that tomorrow's game, PSG Man City, is a potential we see one of the Champions League winners at the end of the at the end of the season? Do you think one of those two are going to lift the trophy? Uh fr- from a footballing point of view, hopefully not, because both teams, you know, they're just all or, or, or right, if 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 you know a Middle East owner come and bought Arsenal, I probably wouldn't complain. Or come and bought Ox, I wouldn't complain. But obviously, obviously with Man City and PSG, obviously they've come in and bought sort of those two teams. And yeah, yeah, I do. I just don't like. I just don't really like the way they're run. And I, like, I, to be fair, like I have a massive hatred for PSG as well. Not just how the way they run, but you even look at like their team. They're just a team full of individuals and that team full of massive egos that I, I just can't stand them. I mean, people talk about Neymar being the third best player in the world. I'm sorry, he's, he's not up there for me. He's not up there for me. He, he went he went to PSG to have a money day and to think he'd have a laugh with his mates. And he even thought he was going to challenge for the Champions League title, which is quite hilarious. I mean, all right, they did come close um, a couple of seasons back when they lost to Bayern in the final. But he, it's even like things like that, like, that they'll they'll win like a knockout tie against someone like Dortmund and Bayern Munich, and they'll celebrate as if they've won the competition. It's kind of like you, you look at you look you look at your other elite teams like your Bayern Munichs, your Barcelonas. Now, all right, yeah, they'll you know high five each other and that, but then it's straight on to the next Champions League game or whatnot. They focus on the next game, whereas PSG they almost live like they've like won the competition when they've won a last sixteen tie. I mean. The, the tie against Bayern Munich last season summed up perfectly. They they beat them in like the quarterfinals. It was only on away goals, and Bayern didn't have Lewandowski because he was out injured. And they celebrated that as if they would won the competition. It's kind of like that's just that's just massive ego trip in my opinion. Um, obviously, both them and Man City have enough quality to win the Champions League. And that I just, for a footballing point of view, I just hope none of those teams don't win it. In terms of other games that. Obviously, interested, like you said, Juventus versus um, Chelsea is going to be an interesting one. Obviously, with obviously, I think it's confirmed. I think Fabrizio Romano confirmed it on Twitter that both um, Paolo Dybala and Alvaro Morata are out for Juventus through injury. I know Dybala come off after twenty two minutes um, at their game at the weekend against Sampdoria. So obviously, it'll be interesting to see who they go with up top. Whether they do go with Moise Keane, who obviously. We probably will have a point to prove, like considering obviously he did nothing in English football and that. And I think obviously he is on loan at Juventus with an obligation to buy and that. And obviously, too fair, like Juventus, they do have a bit of depth up there as well. Obviously, you've got Chiesa, who's an amazing winger. Like he was one of Italy's best players 
at the Euros. Obviously, they got Bernadeski as well. Obviously, Dejan Kulusevski, who's an FM Wonder kid, and that who obviously can play up there as well. And another game which obviously would be a bit interesting would be Benfica versus Barcelona. Obviously, with Barcelona with their financial turmoil. I mean, it really baffles me when I see like gossip pages, and it's like, "Ah, oh, Barcelona want this player," or "Ah, oh, Barcelona." Of how talk, you know, Laporte has held talks with Roberto Martinez as becoming manager. It's like that's all said and good. No, all right, I get it because obviously they're a big club as Barcelona, but how are they going to afford it? They're over a billion pounds in debt. How in the world are they going to afford players or you know to pay you know the Belgian FA compensation to bring um, like Martinez in? Or how how are they going to afford to pay off Coman? Because I think that was another interesting thing. I think. I think they did. I think there was like a fourteen-day period throughout the summer. I was, I was reading like this great article from. Um, I, I'm probably going to butcher his name here, but Guillaume Belagoué. I think that's how you say his name. Yeah, he, well, you know. He 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 did a um article on BBC Sport on about just the toxic atmosphere at Barcelona. Apparently, there was a fourteen-day period where Laporta was looking was actively looking for a manager to replace Ronald Koeman, and. <laughs> I think Ronald Koeman's agent stirred the pot a bit and just said, well, it's like being in a marriage with someone who's actively looking for someone better than you. And that, that that's how obviously it feels on um, Ronald Koeman's end. But I, I think that's going to be an interesting game because obviously that, that they, won, they won at the weekend. Obviously, it relieved a bit of pressure off Koeman. I know Ansu Fati scored on his return. Obviously, huge weight on his shoulders, obviously having the messy number 10 shirt. And Benfica again, they're a bit like what Ed's saying with Porto. They're, they aren't they aren't mugs. They're you know they're Champions League regulars, and I believe they're hundred percent record in the Portuguese league as well. I mean, obviously, obviously the sporting in me, obviously after watching sporting, kind of wants don't, don't, doesn't want Benfica to win. But yeah, obviously with the whole Barcelona's troubles and that, I I think that would be I think that'd be a closer game than what people will think. So yeah, it is a. Definitely an interesting round of fixtures in this week's Champions League. Yeah, and I didn't do Spanish, but I know Ed Priest did. So, Ed, how would you pronounce uh, the Spanish football journalist that Chris tried to pronounce if it was incorrect? I was just trying to put in our chat that it's a bit like when Tommy from Come Fly With Me tries to go to Prague. He goes, <laughs> Prague, <laughs> you mean Prague. I just said it was Guillem Balaguer. Oh, so you did. There you go. Well, I think it's Gwil and Um Yeah, who knows? If anyone's Spanish would like to correct us, then feel free. Um, Barnes, well, well, I know obviously tomorrow your attention will probably be partly on the biggest game of Tuesday night, which is Oxford United versus Accrington Stanley at Kassam. In, <laughs> who are they? In, in, in League One, of course. <laughs> um, but what, where, in terms of the continent, where is your attention going to be focused on? Uh, well, Chris has just done exactly what I think Jack did to me when we last talked on the podcast and we picked out some Champions League games and he picked out all the same ones I've, <laughs> I just uh, thought about. But I think the I think Chris makes some great points about the, the Benfica-Barcelona game. It's going to be so interesting, isn't it? Because if if Barcelona lose, you know, it, it just gets worse and worse for them. And, you know, the situation that football club is, it's just because they've been so good in recent series and they're such a a huge brand sort of see them you know us talk about benfica barcelona as a you know very tricky tie for them is really interesting or we might see a luke de jong master class but yeah wow. I, I highly doubt it <laughs> a highly another game that i think is a very spicy one is uh, manchester united villarreal on the wednesday mm. um obviously a replay of the europa league final last season um Manchester United lost their first game to Young Boys, lost at the weekend to Aston Villa. So, a bit of pressure on um, Oli to get a decent result here, um, especially if he wants to to top the group. And Villarreal, I'm pretty sure, are unbeaten this season under Unai Emery. So, I think it's going to be quite a tense atmosphere at Old Trafford, particularly to start with, if they don't get an early goal. And Unai Emery absolutely loves a draw. So I reckon they really could sit in for this game and cause Manchester United some problems. But, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, Manchester United, as, as we spoke about earlier, have got great players. So it shouldn't be too much trouble, but you, you never know. Like I said, when a team's under pressure, strange things can happen. Um, I think the Milan-Atletico Madrid game is interesting one in that group because I think 
with tough the group. positive tough result group. for Liverpool. Yeah, it's a tough group. And with Liverpool winning that opening game, I think that kind of gives them a bit of leeway and a bit of confidence to do well. Whereas Atletico drew, didn't they, to Porto? And then Milan lost. So I think that's both of them are kind of under pressure to get the get the three points. Um, and I'm not sure... I'm not sure who's going to come out on top. I mean, on paper, you'd say Atletico, but I, I thought Milan played really well against Liverpool, but I don't know if that's just sort of the style of foot. It was a very frenetic game against Liverpool. And let's face it, Diego Simeone, you are not going to get frenetic. Um, so I imagine it'd be a bit more low scoring. But yeah, I think that'd be good fixtures. But yeah, the Juventus-Chelsea one is is obviously an, in, an interesting one as well. But yeah, I don't, I don't have too much to you know forward on from what Chris said on that. Yeah, Atletico playing away from home. They're just going to park the bus, aren't they? <laughs> You'd have thought. Yeah, absolutely. Interesting on the Man United game, Mr. Lathy, we bring him up again, um, put on our chat, was it yesterday, day before, that said, if Man United go out of the group stage of the Champions League, will Oli get sacked? I thought that was an interesting comment for him to make. He clearly is starting to get on the side of Oli out. What do we think, boys? Do we think if, if they don't even make it through the group, he should go? Well, he said Man United will win the Premier League, so obviously he's backtracking a bit, <laughs> any. Um, obviously, obviously, following on from Barnes's point about Villarreal, obviously, obviously, Villarreal held Real Madrid to a nil-nil draw at the weekend. I think it was at the Bernabeu as well. So, you know, they've got pedigree from getting a, you know, getting a result at the weekend. But yeah, I, I think Oli could be in trouble if he doesn't get out of the group, especially with the squad he's got and. You look at Man United's group compared to the other English teams. You'd probably say, on paper, they've probably got the e- the easiest. They should be walking it. Yeah. yeah. How interesting would it be if they don't get a win against Villarreal and then they go and play Everton at the weekend? The Rafa Benitez. Oh, that could be unreal. Yeah. <laughs> I think the uh, I think the Man United coach there could be a bit nervous. He could be a bit Ollie stressful, maybe. <laughs> uh, well, on that pun. We're um, pushing it. <laughs> Lynchy, uh, is there anywhere that you've got your eye on over the next couple of days in the Champions League that you think could be story worthy? I, I think the AC Milan and Atletico Madrid has got is really interesting just because I mean AC Milan have been really impressive this season. I mean how the model sort of changed for them. Obviously they had in the, I was watching a quite an interesting podcast um about it. Uh, watching a YouTube video, sorry about it. Um how their models changed so drastically because obviously they used to spend massive money on players, didn't they? Like Ibrahimovic the first time round. Um, Kaka, players like that, and how their model has had to change so dramatically, but how it's actually sort of working out for them so far um, in the past couple of years. And I mean, like Ash said, they didn't roll over against Liverpool. It was quite a tough game away at Anfield, and they put put in a good performance. So I don't think it'd been by no means would be an easy game for Atletico Madrid. And I remember see Chrissy as well mentioned a couple of podcasts ago about Atletico pushing to win the Champions League this year. So I think that'd be a really interesting game. I think the Villarreal game as well, Man U, just because in my mind, if I was a Man U supporter now, I think Villarreal would probably be one of the last teams I want to face because, I mean, they're so hard to break down. I mean, we saw in that Europa League final, Unai Emery would just be happy to go there and just park the bus and get a nil-nil and he'll love annoying the Man U fans like that. I mean, I just checked the Spanish league table. I mean, they got one win and five draws this season, Villarreal. <laughs> no losses. You know, not, Unai Emery will not mind going there and doing that because that's just the type of manager he is and his style of play and the fans just have to put up with that. And I think Man U fans it could get on the players' backs, I think. You know, if they haven't got a goal in the first 30 or by half time, could start getting a bit nervy. I mean, it's sort of similar to the Aston Villa game in a way at the weekend. You know, the team that come their way, they're not expecting to win, but they have they have more than enough ability to nick a goal against Man U. I think that's a bit of a, definitely a sticky fixture for Man U. So I, I, yeah, I'll be keeping an eye on those. So obviously, PSG, Man City is the big spectacle, isn't it? I mean, I think it's quite interesting how Pep said um, we have like we have no plan, or we like it's impossible to um, break. Uh, it's impossible to plan for PSG. Sort of almost giving himself a uh, a get out clause, I guess, if they do go and lose the game before. I mean, I mean, I think it's a bit of a silly comment to be honest. Like. When you've got players at Man City, have you can you can always come. At, you know, if you want to win the Champions League, you've got to come up against the best teams like PSG. So I think obviously that'd be the standout fixture of the this Champions League week. But yeah, there's definitely a couple of interesting fixtures. Yeah, I think uh, the AC Milan point is really interesting. Um, I think isn't it their first time in the Champions League for what six, seven years or something? Um, yeah, I don't know how long, long, long time. Yeah, but you know, they, do you think it's the Gazidis effect? 
Uh, yeah, there you go. Baff- <laughs> baffling as well because he did the complete opposite at Arsenal and he's gone there and he actually seems to be doing something good. I, I, yeah, ironically, when you were saying that, Lynch, I thought maybe is that a, a model for Arsenal to follow? You know, they they drop out of the Europe's top competition for a few years, but they have to sort of change their model. You know, get young players in, etc. Mm. Ironically, is that is that something Arsenal should be following? Who knows? And the and you know the early Bath podcast, early Bath football podcast confirms that Unai Emery loves a draw. Other pieces of furniture are available, of course. But there you go. There you go. Hey. Um, hey. Well, a couple of puns. Uh, we're going to move on to my last segment of today, which is a bit of a weird one. It's just called Six Aside Teams. But uh, we'll give some context. The context is, I asked the boys a couple of weeks ago. I don't know when it was, actually. But if you could name... Uh, it was originally a five-a-side team, but we increased it to six, and I'll tell you why. But if you could name a six-a-side team of players with only your name, first name or last name, what would be your six side team and it was originally five but we added it to six because you had to include a famous slash celebrity person in this prestigious lineup i'm going to go for a couple of the boys uh uh thoughts today so we'll start with chris let me put it on the screen for you here's chris's team do you want to talk us through it chris so obviously the, to get the elephant out of the room straight away obviously you'll see Obviously, they're called Christian, and that obviously my Christian name, pun in, fully intended on this, is Christian. Very good. And that, so obviously, obviously, I have gone for a team of Christians and not religious ones, hopefully. <laughs> no, um, um, so obviously, in goal is Christian Walton, who is who is he, play, he plays for Brighton, but he's on loan at Ipswich Town at the moment. Fun fact I've seen Christian Walton play before, I've seen him play for Wigan against obviously at Oxford. He kept a clean sheet as Wigan beat Oxford seven nil. How how the how the come on Chris? Start, we don't how, need how, to talk about I'll that. I just stop you there. Can I stop you there? Because <laughs> Owens joined us. Let me just let me just hide the screen quickly so everyone can say hello to I'm, Owens. I'm, I'm here. I'm here. How, how have just... you been there? I've I, no like two seconds ago. I I came in. I clicked the link and then I realised I wasn't logged in, so I couldn't add myself to the actual show. So I was just oh. kind of sat there for a while. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> Owens, this is fantastic. Christian. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. We're talking We've just about our from, five from, from aside, uh, six aside teams. So here we go. Chris, carry on. Sorry. Carry on, Chris. So, so, yeah, obviously, I've seen Christian Walton play. The, man, those Pep Clotet days were dark at Oxford. Um, <laughs> obviously, I've gone for one. I've gone for one defender. I've gone for Christian Fuchs and his wonderful left foot. Um, just Premier League winner. Just a bit of experience back there, and I, I think he can play a ball out of defence. Obviously, my next player is obviously my celebrity pick. I've gone with Christian Bale. You know, I'm going to ask Christian Bale to play even one or two of his acting roles. Even one role would be just play Batman, just sneakily take out, you know, the opposition and that or play his role from American Psychopath, which is Patrick Bateman. You know, the name's in the title, really. People... People wouldn't want to go near him if he played Patrick Bateman in that central <laughs> defensive field role. Obviously, the two in front of him, very technical players in Christian Pulisic and Christian Eriksen. And obviously, all of us at the Early Bar Football Podcast hopes we see Christian Eriksen on the football pitch very soon, you know, after what happened in the summer, obviously, with him suffering a sudden cardiac arrest. You know, we wish Christian a speedy recovery. And up front is... The, the lump that is Christian Benteke, who <laughs> plays for plays for an awful team in Crystal Palace, isn't that right, Ed? He plays for an awful team. Yeah, awful I, side. Going to struggle this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but obviously Benteke is up there just to hopefully just hold the ball up and just feed Pulisic and Eriksen, who, are, who probably will get the majority of my goals because let's face it, Benteke will probably get one or two. Uh, and and lads open question for all the lads what do you think of Chris's side should there be any other Christians or Chris's or uh, whatever olives that should be in this squad well Christian Romero is a surprising loss Um, is that just because you're an Arsenal fan you could could have Olive uh, Khan and have him as goalkeeper (laughs) it's not really an Oliver Mm. Ah, it's it's bending the rules though isn't it uh, who gives a shit about the rules, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> Me, if we're going to come on to my team. Well, here we go. What a natural segue. Team, here we go. My I'm like, oh my goodness. Horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> this was the most difficult challenge ever, if you have the name Edward. Um, can, I just, can I just make a quick point, Ed? Yep. 
It's like Josh Lafey's poor manager for <laughs> FM tactics has made his way onto your team. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, it, if it was Josh Lafey, I'd have this tactic and then tell them to play down the left. <laughs> it, it, it'd work because it'd be downloaded as well. Anyway, I digress. Continue. Copy and paste. Continue. Yeah, so when, when Kieran proposed this challenge, I thought, oh, that's a good idea. That's, you know, that's going to be interesting to think about suddenly realized there are so few professional footballers that have the name Edward that is outrageous. Couldn't believe it. So I've had to, I say bend the rules. This is the team that I've gone with where the rules were quite strict. And so I have used versions of my name. A lot of them, as you can see, Edward is in the surname. I have a much better team <laughs> if I could bend yeah, the rules slightly and include players such as Edison, Edgar Davids, Edin Dzeko, Edison Cavani. Um, if I run through this side, in goal, I've got my celebrity, Edward Norton, who famously played the Hulk. So I'm hoping that he can channel some of that and just fill the goal, <laughs> especially if we're playing nice. six aside, it'll only be a small goal. Uh, at centre half. Terrible I'm discipline looking... record. <laughs> Terrible record. <laughs> record. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sent off a lot. Um, it does, yeah. At centre half, I've got the Aston Villa and Wolves legend, so to speak, uh, Rob Edwards. Um, he's currently manager of Forest Green Rovers. Fun fact. Oh, wow. Yeah. Vegan. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> 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 at right back, I've got Carlos Edwards, Sunderland legend. Um, he, I did a bit of uh, research into this team as to how many Premier League appearances they've got. The total is 88, and Carlos Edwards has got 35 Good. of them. So nice. That's how much I was struggling. I've got a grand total of 88 <laughs> Premier League appearances, not even starts, appearances between my team. Mm. Um, in front of him, I've got Marcus Edwards, uh, the young Tottenham player who I don't think he's at Tottenham anymore, but he was at one point. I think he came on in the Europa League or something like that. Um, and then up front, I've got Eddie Nketiah, where pretty much the other half of the Premier League appearances come from and probably the best player in my team, alongside Carl, uh, Kyle Edwards, who is still playing, played for West Brom. I think he's now at Ipswich. So, yeah, that is my horrendous team. Oh, Thoughts? I it's horrendous. Thoughts on this team, guys? I, I like with Edward. I like with Edward Norton. Not only was he obviously the Hulk, he was also in Fight Club. So True. this, this uh, sort of discipline record is going to be tough. Mm. Going to be very yeah. tough. <laughs> Uh, Carlos I, I, Edwards I, I, takes a mean free kick as well. I, I, I was going to say, I thought we don't talk about Fight Club. <laughs> oh, no. I think our, I think our style yeah. of play, I think our style of play would be Burnley esque, physical and direct, oh, and crap. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a lovely little segment. Now, we're going to continue with the other Bath boys. They will be giving their six aside teams. So, do shout your uh, suggestions to the rest of the guys. Um, Owen, because you've joined us, I feel I was going to wrap up, but I feel like I should say hello. How was your birthday? And you've just come off live nice. with you as well, haven't you? So, how Yeah, you? I literally just finished like five minutes ago, so I thought I'd come across since I was here. I'm good. I'm good. I'm older. Oh, yeah, fatter. No wiser. No, new, new wee, baby. I, you know what I did enjoy though. I, I, I did see obviously the episode on Friday and um, really did enjoy. Um, should we say a less than sober Chrissy Olive on that episode? Um, his Steve Bruce impression of when he actually physically got up out of his chair and ran off was tremendous. And uh, what I did enjoy is just it felt like. It felt like an episode of like the royal family because as the episode went on, he just sat there with a can and it sounded like that the whole time. And just occasionally you could just hear it. <laughs> it was tremendous. Great content. Yeah, it was some lovely ASMR with Chris opening his can of, uh, was it San, Mi San Miguel? Was it, Chris? It, it, it was San Miguel, yeah. I, I, I got a quick question for you about, about the stream you've just done tonight. Yes. Obviously, obviously, Tang's made a few puns in this one about oh. Ollie going Solskjaer. Was it an Ollie sexual stream or was it an Ollie stressful stream? Mm. No, it, there wasn't any Ollie sexual comments tonight or anything like that. No, it was quite it was quite constructive. It was about reportedly um Ollie getting like wow, backing from the board, but it wasn't but that was from one reporter that's 50-50 at the best of times to be honest with you. ESPN. Big outlet in the United States, but over here 
no. But it, 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 was, it was also like, it was just a case of like, he doesn't, he doesn't need the board to come out and back him because everyone knows he's not going to get sacked tomorrow or the day after or the day after. Like, he could lose in the week. He's not going to get sacked. Unless something, you know, really goes wrong, we don't get out of the, out the group and the Mamas off it in the league, then maybe at the end of the year in like December, maybe something will happen then. But the way that United play, we'll just as easily win Wednesday and maybe get out of the group. I think the big, it's a bigger discussion point of um, whilst we might get through the group and whilst we might win a couple of games in the row now in the Premier League, are we actually going to win the Premier League? Probably not. Are we going to win the Champions League? Probably not. And I think that's the overall frustration with United fans is that it feels like inevitable. But we're going to have to wait till the end of the season, I think. Come the end of the season, when we probably haven't won a trophy and we are still a bit off it in the league, then it'd be a case of, well, you've got no excuses anymore. So, I don't expect a Doan segment. I know, I've just kind of come in and... Uh, <laughs> trampled all over it. that's what i do no, brother we've um in this episode owen we've coined the phrase ollie skeptical can you bring that onto the united view please <laughs> yeah, ollie skeptical i can bring that in i would just say i'm ollie skeptical i tell you what actually that is bloody good because i've i won't say like ollie out or anything like that because i'm not because i'm not because i do hope that it turns around and i do hope that he proves me wrong and he wins something and i'm not going to be one of those people that it's like i'm ollie out or anything like that because once you say it it's very final you can't go back from it because if you got Molly out and then like you know two, we win on Wednesday, and I'm like, well, I'll get him to the end of the year. It was like I thought you said you're Molly out, so you can't you can't go there. It's a very it's a very big commitment that. So if I say I'm Molly skeptical, that gives me a bit of leeway. I like mm. that. Molly yeah. skeptical. Good. Um, Good. That's the end of my <laughs> unexpected Owen segment. What a segment that was, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that was fun. Um, yeah. I think that's everything that we wanted to discuss, to be honest. Um, lo Owen, lovely to see you. Lovely to make the unexpected Owen segment. I had, you know, it was nice to have uh, that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I it's think it was better than my mum appearing again, that's for sure. Yeah, I, 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 mum came again. <laughs> come on, come on. We we all know I can't top that. I can't, I can't top that. <laughs> um, but absolutely <laughs> lovely speaking to you boys. Uh, I'm sure we'll do it again very soon. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like, comment, subscribe. A five star review would be lovely. Uh, please do share, download, listen, watch, whatever you do on your streaming platform. And we will say wave and goodbye. So wave and goodbye. Uh, and I'll see you very soon. End broadcast. <laughs>